Hey, how's it going everyone? Just want to do a video on Deutsche Bank. So uh, for those of you who kind of follow financial markets and stuff, this is a very important um, bank that is worth, um, you know, just checking in on, on what it's doing. And um, so I'm just looking at the stock price right now. It's at $8.38 and it was down over 4% today. And, um, you know, I just want to talk about the company. Um, just look at its financial statements that were published, you know, that are available publicly, and, you know, and get a sense of why this, this ship is sinking and why this, this might be one of the companies that, um, you know, triggers the meltdown this time. Um, or it could be GE as well, who um, are in a very similar situation financially. So just want to talk through the financials and, um, you know, see if we can, you know, get a little bit of insight into what's going on underneath the hood. So fundamentally, a company is only as good as its cash flow. You know, this is, should not be a mystery. If a company is not, you know, generating cash um, consistently, obviously, then uh, that's a problem. Um, you know, companies like Netflix and, and all this are still kind of growing and heavily, heavily dependent on debt. But, um, you know, they obviously have like a subscription base. And, and that's why on their conference calls, that number growing is extremely important to the stock price because that is the, really the only thing that will drive their ability to, um, you know, one day generate positive cash flow, which the last I checked, it's not, it, it hasn't yet. But, you know, the, the cash flow, the actual amount uh, is important, obviously, like month to month, and then the flow of it, whether it's consistent and um, hopefully trending upwards as well. And so cash flow, uh, I want to link that um, almost it's pretty much directly linked to net income. So I'm going to we're going to look at Deutsche Bank's, um, you know, uh, income statement. And um, basically net income will turn into cash given enough time, like, uh, you know, all the collection uh, delays are taken into account and, um, you know, that, that type of thing. So we can think for now, like loosely, um, that net income and cash are, are effectively the same thing. And so, you know, if we look at Deutsche Bank's uh, net income statement, consolidated statement of income for all their companies, the first thing that is important to notice is that there are two major line items that they generate income via net uh, interest income and commissions and fees. So you'll see, uh, it might be a little bit hard to see, but just know that those two lines are the two major ways that, that they make income and they're roughly the same, like 50-50 split. Looks like uh, interest income is a little bit more typically. But, um, you know, that's that's what a bank does. You know, it has access to uh, money um, or credit that is um, given to it by by a central bank. And then it will go out and look for places to, um, you know, invest in whatever countries it's, uh, it's situated in and, um, you know, generate interest uh, income from that. And then it also will generate revenue from, you know, commissions, which is like uh, mergers and acquisitions, like activity related to. Um, you know, charging for even, um, you know, financing, you know, consultation, like corporate finance, consulting and, and all that kind of stuff. They, they'll have, you know, MBAs and just finance people who will not necessarily be um, offering uh, financing, but even just the intelligence around it and how to structure um, debt versus equity and all that kind of stuff. So you can see those are their two major, you know, um, revenue generating streams. But I want to draw attention to you know, what's going on with their income statement here. So you can also see that their two major expense line items are compensation and benefits and um, general and administrative expenses. So, you know, comp compensation and benefits, is obviously, you know, paying, you know, their employees, headcount related directly. And um, SG&A are just, you know, overhead, like just, um, you know, rent for their buildings, um, electricity for their buildings, computers, uh, you know, everything that all the travel and all that stuff needed to, um, you know, acquire their, their revenue streams. And so those two line items basically, uh, almost, uh, offset completely. And in some, and in some years and some months, uh, were higher uh, than their income. So if you look at the line, the bottom line that I highlighted their net income or loss, uh, for 2016, they were actually at a loss. And so these numbers are in millions. So they were running a loss of 1.3 billion, 
and um you know you can see like uh you know they have uh, looks like in Q1, Q2, and Q3 of 2017, they had a they had a positive income, but uh, at the end of the year, they they took a huge loss, and um, that actually created a loss for their entire year of a 735 million for all of 2017. So they basically are uh, you know their expenses are exceeding their their revenue for all of 2017 and also for 2016, and so you can see in 2018. You know, for Q1, they have positive, you know, net income um, for Q1, Q2, and Q3. But um, they also had that for 2017, and they took a huge drawdown in, in 20, at the end of 2017 and Q4. So I have a feeling there are just year-end um, adjustments they have to make, you know, and, um, you know, really, really do a proper valuation on, um, on all their loans and stuff like that. So I think that... Uh, Again, I don't know actually, you know, what the future will hold for them in Q4, but th- it's possible that they could have another situation like they did in in the last two years, where their Q4, you know, generates a huge loss and then it actually wipes out all their gains for the whole year. But you can see they're they're basically running kind of, uh, e- you know, even like they're breaking even. Let's say if we aggregate for the last couple of years, they're either even or running at a loss. So they're actually like burning cash. You know, they're they're ha- they have more expenses than they have revenue to support those, you know, that those expenditures, and so you know, obviously that has um, implications. That's not you know uh, a way a company can be run and sustained, uh, even in the short term. So you know, let's take a look at their uh, balance sheet, and so just uh, for for people who are kind of new, I guess, to the accounting world, um, assets will always have to be equal to your liabilities plus owner's equity. And this this is should make sort of you know sense intuitively because if you have an asset, you either own it yourself through equity, uh, what's called in this case shareholders equity, uh, or someone else has loaned you the money for it. So there's only two options for how you acquire the money to get those assets, whether they be um, you know a forklift or a truck or a building or um, whatever you know industry that that. Um, that you might be in here at Deutsche Bank, the asset is is money, and so their their asset amount, uh, which would be the total of um, you know the one three one 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 ninety four plus sixty two five seventy seven uh, for as of September thirtieth, twenty eighteen, the sum of those two numbers is their assets, and so those would be you know cash balances, and it looks and from this it'll tell you that. Uh, one point three one or one three one 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 ninety four of that uh, they don't own themselves. So that would be uh, if you look up in the liability section at the top, they would be like demand deposits, time deposits, savings deposits. So they're like they're us. They're like regular people's money that's sitting in there. So it's not theirs. And the piece that's theirs is represented by the shareholders' equity, and it's a uh, sixty two five seventy seven. So you can see that they're what's called their debt to equity ratio is massive. I, I I think I divided those numbers and it was like 20 some. Their debt is 20 times their equity. And for typically for other companies or just even even other banks, it's it does it's not wise to have that number, you know, out of the range of like two and three at the most. And this this also makes intuitive sense. Like if you imagine like Deutsche Bank as like a house, uh, this means that they own like, you know, Sixty two five seventy seven of like a one point three one one million dollar home. You know, it's like they they own sixty two thousand dollars worth of a one point three million dollar home. Um, not including the that these numbers are in millions, but let's just let's just assume that these are like uh, what they are. So they own like a very 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 small percentage of a house. So they basically have got into, you know, their first home and uh, they put extremely little down um, as their first payment. Let's let's think of the 62000 as their down payment on a $1.3 million home. And that's, you know, that's, I guess, possible, you know, that, that people can do that if, if they have, you know, the ability to like, uh, you know, uh, pay, make payments and uh, make potentially large payments. And the problem with Deutsche Bank, obviously, from the previous slide is that they're not making any money. So it would be like us buying a $1.3 million home, putting our life, everything we have down, $62,000 down, but not having a job. 
you know, like we we don't have any uh, or we have a job, but we, we're breaking even and, and cannot, you know, make any payments on our house ever. And so it's just uh, it's just sitting there. You know, we just have this big debt that's just sitting there of one point three million dollars. And, you know, we we have a we have a job, but it only can pay off like our our food, our car, you know, family stuff and all that. We're not able to make a penny. And and uh, in fact, we're actually not even uh, able to uh, sustain ourselves in those other areas. So we're running a deficit and and borrowing a little bit more just to um, make ends meet day to day. So we're not even getting to our one point three million dollar home payments. And so that's bad, you know, like um, this is not a sustainable company. Uh, this just uh, the numbers just just don't work. If you're sitting on that much liability and you're not, you know, generating any net income or cash, positive cash flow. I mean, that's uh, that's bad. And it's one thing if, you know, they they were expecting, you know, a change in the in the business climate to like increase and, you know, the, the revenue will come. But, you know, we're so late in the cycle that um, it's going to be harder and harder for Deutsche Bank to make money, you know, certainly in the next year or two. And and I'll explain why in in a future slide. But just from this simple, uh, this is, again, public information. This is their latest um, Q3 2018, you know, financial statements. But just a quick look at it shows like how, you know, they're just in really, really bad shape. You know, they're just losing money and uh, they're just so heavily indebted and they have very little retained earnings and and I'll explain to you really what's going on. They're basically just siphoning interest uh interest income to uh to their employees and giving them huge bonuses. So it's very much like a short-term um short-sighted business model. So this uh this is the natural implication if uh if a majority of your expenses are you know compensation and benefits and you're losing money, well then the natural thing would be to just uh you have to fire people you know because you can't keep having a you know negative income uh month over month year over year and um you know expect uh your stock price to not not go to you know pretty much immediately go to zero so they have to try at least to like um, get a positive income and at least you know give give their shareholders some hope that uh you know they're not just going to keep running deficits and then um, shrink uh, their um, their uh, shareholders' equity every month because every month your your earnings and this is just an accounting fact uh, your net income go- rolls into your what's called retained earnings which is the major account in your shareholders' equity so basically if month over month you're losing money or your net income is negative then what happens is your retained earnings goes lower and lower and so your shareholders' equity you know, drops month over month. And so effectively every month that you are losing income or having a net income, your shareholders equity is going down further. So this explains why their stock price has also been going down and fairly aggressively is that if you're not generating any income and your shareholders equity is shrinking relative to your liabilities, you know, obviously you're not returning any value to your shareholders. You're actually shrinking their, um, presence in the company with um with liabilities with debt and so that's what's happening and so they have no choice like i pulled this from their um uh their shareholder um package that their workforce reductions are on track and the the point that i wanted to highlight is that um management reaffirm and this is the second paragraph management reaffirms its target to reduce the workforce to below ninety three thousand by the end of 2018 uh, from a company that's about ninety five thousand, and well below ninety thousand by the end of twenty nineteen. So I just that's you know how vague that is, but well below ninety thousand means obviously we're talking eighty thousand, seventy thousand. You know, it's not like eighty nine thousand five hundred kind of thing. So basically, there's there has to be more and more layoffs, and it again makes sense if um, if the future uh, projection is that there's less and less activity and they have they're driving less and less interest income or commissions and fees um for their um you know other investment banking activities they have to reduce their headcount you know because that's their major expense line item that they control sgna is largely fixed you know the buildings and the rent and the uh, 
you know, electricity and all the computers and all that. A lot of those stuff, it's hard to really, you know, change unless you shut down an entire building, which I have a feeling they'll be doing as well. But the first obvious thing is just to reduce the headcount because the activity is going down. So this basically implies that uh, activity is slowing down. So if activity is slowing down, they're not going to be in an environment where net income will ever get positive. So it's going to continue to get negative and uh, it's going to continue to reduce their shareholders equity which reduces their stock price. So even just by them admitting that their headcount is going to be well below 90,000 by the end of 2019 implies that their revenue as well uh, will be going down. And that also will most likely, you know, mean that their their net income will be pretty much zero or continue to stay on the, on the negative side or like very, very slightly positive. So, you know, they're going to be running very, very thin and, um, you know, obviously not in a growth growth situation for the next year or two. But I wanted to do a quick quick slide on M&A. So we hear this term mergers and activi- mergers and acquisitions and this activity actually uh typically intensifies pretty close to a, a bust uh, a bear market. And so basically what happens is you have two companies and then let's say company 1 is is acquiring company 2. And then so Typically, this is not good for either company, but definitely, you know, not so good for the smaller company because what will typically happen is that they'll look for like synergies like and this is they meaning the investment bank like Deutsche Bank. Uh, They have an investment banking division like uh, like all the other big ones, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley and all that. They'll say they'll look for a company and then they'll they'll call, you know, other companies that it might acquire a target. And then they'll say like, hey, you guys, uh, you know, if you bought this company at this valuation, you know, you have um, synergies, you have overlap, you have redundancies that if you were to go in and buy this company and remove those redundancies and then, you know, integrate, you know, the two companies together, um, you know, you could be operating at this this new, uh, you know, uh, cash flow and, and have these financials and they'll project it all out and say, you know, this, it would be much better for you to buy them. It'll strengthen your financial position. You'd have to reduce this many people from the other company and possibly reduce one or two people from your own company uh, because that new company has that technology but maybe better um, or just removes the need for a couple people or a division. And then so you can kind of trim, quote unquote, trim the fat. Um, and then, you know, you combine them together and you have this new company, um, you know, producing a new set of financial statements that are healthier uh, or more um, sort of. Uh, attractive um, from an investor perspective after it's combined, not good for the individuals in the companies because obviously they're uh, they're let go. But what happens ultimately when these then this grouping happens? So Deutsche Bank makes money for structuring the deal, and that's in their commissions and fees revenue. And then so you know they they make this new company, they take their fee, their cut, and then you know there's a new company operating with like less people and more work for each person to do. You know, it's not like the work goes away, like someone has to still do stuff. And so, you know, the individuals are typically on edge because obviously some people got laid off. Um, And then, you know, they're overworked. And then, uh, you know, Deutsche Bank gets their cut. And then the people at the top, you know, who who manage all these people, um, you know, the valuation of their company goes up, you know, so they're they're happy with that because they're typically the largest shareholders of a company you know, the executives and the people on the on the board and all that kind of stuff. So they win, you know, and they, they might want to do this, more of this potentially right before that they, you know, sell some of their shares, because obviously these kind of things typically will drive the value up. In particular, the, the value of the company that's being bought goes up because they automatically know that most times that that happens, people are going to get laid off. And so their expenses are going to go down. But, um, you know, presumably the revenue will stay the same. And so that that immediately drives up their income. And like I said, that goes into retained earnings, which goes into shareholders equity, which increases the stock price or the stock valuation. Yeah. So or the book value is a better way to say it. So it increases the book value of the stock, which, you know, people who are watching these kind of things uh, might look at that and say, uh, you know, the book value has gone up. So, you know, the actual stock price um uh, you know, it would be a, it would be it would be a good investment to uh, to put money in that, and then uh, the, it could draw, drive the stock price up. And typically, it it gets bumped up a little bit, even on the announcement that a company is being bought. And so, M and A is again good for 
the accounting, like the the numbers, the book value, the stock value, and uh, you know the the banks who are like do, like searching out these targets and and structuring this deal, um, but not for for the employees of the company, because you know um, in the very least, even if the company has the same headcount, you know they're they're going to be looking for redundancies and and all that kind of stuff. Very very rarely would I would I see or think of a company being bought by another one where they're just in completely different um you know areas and there's zero overlap because there's almost always overlap in the very least with like the accounting departments and certain departments that function and you're and are needed no matter what the company is um you know there'll always be overlap you know in those kind of like shared services type um you know functions in a company so there's almost always places to to lay off so or reduce headcount so Here's a quick and honest look at their in- interest income line item. So, you know, they have, you know, like I said, deposits of people, us in their bank. They go and do this multiplier, this fractional reserve concept, and then they go and take $1 and make it into $10. And then um, through basically like a push of a button. And then they go out and look for people who need money, you know, to uh, finance whatever they're financing, whether at the personal level, like you're financing a home or your student loans or um, a car or at the, you know, company is looking for what's called capital expenditures and they want to buy, you know, new equipment. And so Deutsche Bank will be right there at the door ready to loan them money because they got, you know, they took one dollar and made a 10. So they have a lot of money available. And um, then they just, you know, try and look for really anybody who needs a loan and then they're going to start charging interest and uh, they kind of hope that you, um, you know, miss a few payments along the way because then they could make even more money, um, you know, charging fees and, um, you know, higher interest rate and, and all that kind of stuff if you're not able to make payments in a timely manner. So in a way, in the short term, they're, they're okay with you missing payments. Obviously, long term, it will lead to like defaults and then, you know, they're, um, you know, it will not be good for them. Um, long term if they're not able to actually uh, you know uh, basically uh, sustain their their interest income um, with that person because now they've basically removed that person from the pool and then they have to go look you know elsewhere in the pool uh, to to loan out that money and so this is really what's going on is that they're taking you know people's everyday money for whatever stocks their house retirement or whatever in their uh, Deutsche Bank account, and then they go and do fractional reserve or fractional um, banking, and then so they're able to like add a multi, you know, do a multiplier on their um, base amount of money that they have from other people, and then they go loan it out to really anybody, and then charge uh, interest on that, and then like I showed you in the income statement, a big portion of their revenue goes towards uh, compensation and benefits to these bankers. So, you know, this is uh, these are the two major activities that bring, you know, uh, institutions like Deutsche Bank revenue. So, OK, well, what is the end game to all this? To me, you know, the more you kind of get into this, it, it's obviously very much a scheme where, you know, again, banks can take one dollar, turn it into 10 and then literally just shop that ten dollars around to who anybody out there um, who needs something. But the issue with that is that once loan activity dries up and all the people out there who you know, we're looking for a loan, have got one and then either ran a business with it or um, did it and then failed uh, or just no one else is looking for to buy anything new. Um, you know, this uh, this scheme sort of uh, stops, you know, and, and their Deutsche Bank is only as good as the quality of loans that it lent out. And so if it didn't lend out loans to people or companies that are worthy of those loans and uh, not, you know, running viable businesses, you know, this will obviously uh, cut, uh, drop their interest income and, um, you know, affect, uh, you know, their their net income. And so this is when things start to dry up. And so you either have just less loans, you know, uh, available because people are just not spending or buying new things. You can have loan defaults where these companies that you've lent out money to already are just failing. Um, mergers and acquisitions can get exhausted where you've People have gone through and looked at all the different combinations and, you know, there's not enough, there's no more sort of consolidations that can be done, you know, that people have have the appetite for. And um, that will, 
you know, limit their amount of, you know, commissions and fees that they can charge uh, when basically all the M&A is kind of exhausted. And then also is when their headcount reduction strain the economy indirectly. It's like, so if you lay off, you know, 10,000 people a year and it looks like they're in the process of doing that over the next, you know, year, if not more than 10,000. So that has issues like indirectly in the economy because, you know, uh, obviously those people will potentially now be at risk to, you know, have student loan defaults, mortgage defaults, car defaults, car loan defaults, and all that kind of stuff. So, and in particular, this industry is sensitive to that too, because the people that work for these banks, especially the bankers, like they're kind of living a certain lifestyle and they're, they're usually in larger cities and, you know, expensive and all that kind of stuff. So if you have banking shrinking and struggling, because it's basically the easiest business to be in to make money because, the money is basically handed to you and all you have to do is assign where it goes. And, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's not really that much of a value add, you know, to the, to the extent of how much they get rewarded for what they're doing. Um, you know, to me, bank struggling is like a very, very last late in the game stage that things are bad because they're the ones that are doing the least amount of work and not really adding any value producing anything in this whole thing. And so, they're going to, you know, they're incentivized in the short term. So they're going to look for like the Snapchats and the, you know, the newest technology that, you know, is hot that, you know, people that they want to direct money to and might be able to generate, you know, revenue in, in a shorter time frame. And, um, you know, so they can collect their interest income and, and all that kind of stuff and all their, um, you know, consulting fees and all that. And so it's very much a short sighted thing because their bankers just want, you know, their bonus and their commissions and all that, you know, in that year. And so it's it's a it's not um, a wise, you know, allocation of of that money. And so, um, again, this whole the whole system we live in is very much short sighted and uh, generating as much bonus and all that for the bankers in that year. You know, they don't have an incentive to like ensure that the money that they're lending out is is useful for that, you know, country or that economy for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, you know, that's not their uh, incentive, you know, they just want to make sure that they get their bonus for the next two or three years until they move on to something else. And then everybody knows that, you know, working in investment banking is exhaustive, they just, you know, work you to death, you're constantly, I, I guess what they're doing is researching all these targets and producing financial models and presenting it to parent companies and saying, you know, if you buy this company, you know, they'll look like this and we'll charge only this much. And then, you know, this, this will be good for you. And so they're basically scouring, you know, all the financials of all the companies out there in whatever, you know, country they operate in and then preparing presentations and uh, pitching, you know, these ideas. And so, you know, it's, uh, that's, uh, that's kind of the mindset of a banker is like, they're just, they're only able to do that for a few years until they get exhausted. So, you know, like I said, there's not a long term vision, they're not lending out the money to, you know, companies that, you know, serve like a, a long term, you know, um, objective, you know, and, and beneficial for that, for that region. And so, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is the fate of Deutsche Bank. So, you know, just looking at the numbers, it looks like their, their income is, is, either negative or pretty much zero. And um, they have a huge amount of liabilities, which are basically just it's money that's sitting in their accounts, but it's it's effectively um, other people's, you know, they're the individuals that, you know, bank with them. And, um, you know, they have very, very little um, shareholders equity. And so which will lead to a low stock price and a declining stock price, especially if people see that, um, you know, they're not able to generate uh, positive cash flow and not just positive cash flow, but increasing uh, in the near future. So it doesn't surprise me, you know, the stock is is what it's at. I'm surprised this company hasn't folded already. But to me, it will only take, you know, some shock in the system, whether just by Deutsche Bank itself or by something else to, you know, cause uh, this sort of house of cards to collapse. And the problem is the way the banking is so interconnected. Um, you know, let's say if Deutsche Bank does fold and its stock goes to zero like the Lehman Brothers then again we have like 90 some thousand employees that um, overnight don't have jobs and that is a huge um, puts a huge amount of pressure on the job market because now you have thousands and thousands of skilled workers who are used to making a certain amount of money 
adding to the job, you know, the workforce and then, uh, you know, making the, the economy, even uh, the job market even tighter uh, because there are more and more people applying for uh, fewer and fewer jobs. And, and this is such a niche field that it's not like there are, um, you know, plenty of banks that do this kind of stuff that they can just jump right into. And so to me, this is where I see this kind of accelerating next year. Um, I think it's not like obvious yet, like on the streets, but um, I think once um, these layoffs start happening in, in larger and larger quantities, like Ford, GM and uh, companies like Deutsche Bank and GE, you know, I think it's going to start becoming visibly obvious, uh, at least here in America. Okay, hope everyone's doing well. Take care. Bye.